for extending the invitation again to speak. Um, it's always been fun every time I've spoken to this group. Um, I've been doing some work on the Olmsteads in Washington, D.C. So when this opportunity came up, I said, well, how can I connect Capitol Hill with the Olmsteads besides the obvious Capitol Hill grounds? And um, I pitched this botanic gardens idea to you saying, is this close enough? And you all said, yes, it's close enough. So the uh, botanic gardens and the Senate Park Commission, three decades of controversy, I'm addressing um, the creation of the mall as we have it now, the creation of the botanic gardens as we have it now, and how what kind of struggle it was to get there. So that's not. So the Senate Park Commission or Macmillan P Commission plan was a design to utterly transform the mall into a single unified composition combining all the elements that existed. It was at that point divided between going from west to east, the agriculture, Smithsonian, armory, and botanic, botanic gardens. Those were all separate little jurisdictions along the mall. I think of it to some extent like Germany or Italy in the 19th century. The concept existed, but the jurisdictions actually ran what was going on. So there, there was nobody running the mall per se. So we're still creating the mall, actually. It, it's been declared a completed work of art, but you know how completed that happens in Washington. So. But getting from 1902 to now has been uh, a struggle. So with the Botanic Gardens, you know, best intentions, bureaucracy, limited funding, political feuding, memorial trees, and the man who stood in the way most was the man who ran the Botanic Gardens, William R. Smith, who we'll touch on. Um, the area at the Botanic Gardens was getting crowded. The Grant Memorial had been placed there at the head of the mall as a kind of a marker to start the plan. And that was in the Botanic Gardens. And the Meade Memorial came along. And then it wasn't until 1927 that they resolved the issues of the space and what would go where. And then in the 60s, everything changed. So as a chronology, so we have to jump all the way back to the 1816 with the Columbian Institution for the Promotion of Arts and Sciences. So that was one of the, well, we'll talk about them in detail. In 1842, there was the United States Exploring Expedition, which uh, was a scientific expedition, kind of like the Beagle and Charles Darwin. Uh, which went and collected uh, samples of many things, including lots of plants. Um, those plants were at the were at the um, uh, patent office, and then they got moved to the mall. We get the greenhouses built in the 1860s, 70s. There's the Senate Park Commission, then the Grant Memorial, the Mead Memorial, then the new building, and the creation of Union Square, creation of actually the production facility over in Bellevue, and then we have the renovation of the building just, well, doesn't seem like too long ago, but now 20 years ago. So the Columbian Institute, it's one of those 19th century um, uh, organizations to pursue all different kinds of uh, social, economic, uh, scientific uh, goals. In a, in a way, a precursor of the Smithsonian Institution, although it was it was entirely private. So Congress passed an act giving them a piece of the mall for a botanic garden. So uh, they got the spot that the botanic garden was on until the 1920s. So, and this is a map showing what it was. So, 
the map itself I flipped upside down because I wanted north to be north. And I'm curious about the description. I I didn't have a chance to check out the actual measurements, but the description says five acres, part of the mall. That's important. Appropriated for the use of the Columbian Institute, uh, 1820. Now, if you look at this and you can see I put some arrows in there. You can't read it because it's sideways, but that says first street west. So that line that's half right in the middle of it is actually where first street is. So that land they got for the Botanic Garden was going up the west front of Capitol, Capitol Hill. So I'm not quite sure when they pushed the Botanic Gardens off of Capitol, off of Capitol Hill, off the Capitol grounds, but they originally had a piece of what we now consider the Capitol grounds. So the U.S. Exploring Expedition um, in the 18, late 1830s and 40s went around the world. They have these, uh, they went, I didn't look at where all they went, but they collected um, materials to bring back I was thinking, you know, at one point, well, is an exploring expedition kind of redundant? Well, you think about, well, there's also like military expeditions, so um, not exactly redundant. So here's the patent when they came back. They had to store what they had brought back somewhere. So it, in those days, the patent office was where you would store those kinds of interesting artifacts. And the patent office at that point is only the one wing on the south. So behind, the, so you can see this is just that one wing. It doesn't have the rest of the square. And behind that, they built greenhouses for the plants. But the patent office grew like crazy, so they had to expand the building and move those greenhouses away. So where would you put this, these botanical collections? Well, we had a botanic garden, which didn't really succeed, the Columbian Institution, Institute, sorry, on the mall. So let's transfer the materials from the patent office onto the mall to that spot where that botanic garden had not really taken off. So in 1856, they actually created the botanic garden and put it under the Joint Committee on the Library, of the Congress's Joint Committee on the Library which is an important thing to know who's who's actually overseeing this it plays into it later. So they created this, they built the greenhouses, they held on to what had come in through the exploring expedition, uh, but not all of it actually uh, survived. So at this point, 1850s and then 60s and 70s, the Botanic Garden becomes a place for recreation. People would go there to, well, to see the flowers. Um, and by the 1880s, I was looking to see how is it described. And um, this description, Gentleman Joseph Westmore wrote Picturesque Washington, 1888. So he's reporting that of those materials that had come through the exploring expedition, only one, only one tree survives. But we've got a grand conservatory, rivaling Q. It's got a sensitive scientific collection of trees, and it's got the Bartholdi Fountain next to it. And the important thing about Congress and the Botanic Garden is that it was 
I don't know if we could say a flower shop for Congress, but it seems like it was. They could get bouquets of flowers, and at the end of the year, they could get actual plants shipped back to their constituency. So they had a vested interest in, they and their families had a vested interest in this. And uh, so that impeded making any changes. Now, Congress liked having this flower shop down at the foot of the of Capitol Hill. And it's not entirely, you know, that's a little bit cynical. Um, they recognized it as a place for the public to come and recreate and imagining, you know, Washington, D.C.'s weather and how, you know, what there was to do. A botanic garden was a, quite a nice amenity to have. So, um, oh, and a point about that one tree that had survived. That one tree seems to have survived until 2011. I was looking it up and that one uh, Chinese jujube uh, was blown down in 2011, but they have the uh, germplasm. So they're growing, you know, they're growing others. So just because the plants themselves may not have survived, they tried to maintain the germplasm so they could reproduce clone uh, descendants of these plants. So a slightly earlier description, but um, a little more friendly one. Um, you've got that conservatory, you've got 10 smaller ones parallel to it to the south. I didn't realize the fountain, the Bartoldi fountain had such a big base then. You look at the map and the, the context doesn't really give you an idea, but that base was 93 feet in diameter. So that's a pretty big base. Um, and the plants and germplasm did, they did distribute it to other botanic gardens throughout the city, uh, no, I'm sorry, throughout the country. And in that conservatory, so imagine a central, round feature and two wings going east and west. So the central round feature had the tropical plants. And then the others were arranged in the wings geographically. So as, as you went east, you would be getting plants that were hardy northerly. And if you went west, southerly. So it's twisted 90 degrees, but you would be like walking from the equator north as you went east and the equator south as you went west. I think that's the best way to describe it. So and we have, here's one of the conservatories. I think this is the older conservatory. So, and the other thing to know is that Washington I exaggerate probably by saying it's a city under glass, but there were far more uh, conservatories and greenhouses in there that you know we may actually think about. So there's the Botanic Garden, there's the White House had it. Now there's an interesting set of greenhouses south of the Washington Monument and west of engraving and printing. So right there where there's just not much of anything now, just some traffic lanes, there was a whole uh, uh, group of propagating uh, greenhouses for the propagating garden. And then agriculture had its own greenhouses and would actually build some more right along Con B Street Constitution Avenue. So now that's, that's the Botanic Garden. So what about the mall itself? So the mall, The mall comes from the LaFont plan, of course. And money and supply you with extra benefits. Like in home support. Oh, I'm sorry, I put them out of order. Like extra control 
Home modifications like bathroom rails and wheelchair ramps. So, what, somebody's not muted. These are not available with original Medicare. What law font by the law and how it would have turned out a law font persisted is not really clear. So, here's a map of the law font plan, and then the description you know, a Grand Avenue, 400 feet in breadth, about a mile in length. Bordered with gardens ending in a slope from the houses on each side. This avenue leads to the monument and connects with the, the Congress Garden. So that's all there is as far as what LaFont said about the mall. So that gives lots of scope for interpretation or reinterpretation. Um, and in 1900, as people are considering what to do about the city, the engineers took that map and, re and redrew it. So to say, well, this is, you know, a cleaner version of what we think L'Enfant meant by the mall. And um, again, you know, how do all those, you know, you can get into a lot of landscape architecture questions of how does, how does those, those buildings relate to each other? Is that really a street down the middle with trees lining it? How are the north south axes working? Um, but uh, that's what the engineers thought. Um, if I go back just a couple slides, I can show you what some other people thought the mall might look like. So, um, one part of creating the mall was dealing with the uh, Tiber Creek, which turned into a canal. So in the 1820s, they decided to reroute the canal. They took those, what's now four squares there, so two to the north and two to the south, and Missouri and uh, Main Avenues, and they turned those into developable things and they moved the canal to the middle of the mall. And then, uh, so connecting it to uh, Tiber Creek coming down and to a pool and right at the base of Botanic Garden. So now here's uh, Mills's idea in the 1840s of what we could do with the mall. And it has, you know, has a space for the botanic garden. It has a lot of things there. So one of the questions always is, or one of the assumptions is uh, that there was a L'Enfant had a plan for the mall. That should be done. Well, L'Enfant didn't have a lot of detail on his plan for the mall. And in city planning, plans do change. So just to say you're not respecting LaFont's plan doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad thing. This was a different idea of what you could do with this space. And one of the challenges, which I don't think people necessarily, people may recognize this already, but may not, so if you look at the mall now, it looks nice and fairly flat. But if you went back, you would see that from that canal up to what is now B Street, B Street, uh, Independence Avenue, you've got a topography change of 30 plus feet in some places. So if you walk from Constitution now up to the Smithsonian, you've gone up 30 feet. So that's not insuperable in any kind of way, but when you're talking about a sight line that's glancing across that, you know, that adds some different questions. You're, it, that's part of the obstacle to developing the mall in an east-west fashion is you have so much topography that 
is north-south as opposed to east-west. So you can see here, like I was saying, we've divided up the mall into multiple little geographies. And under Mills's plan, and then here's Andrew Jackson Downing's plan, very famous one. And I thought, well, to make it more clear, let me flip it around the other way so you can see. So again, similar, um, a little more land. Uh, so we've got the White House grounds and we swinging over in an L shape to the Capitol. We do have the Botanic Garden at the head of it. We've got it kind of pinched in by those um, lots and main and Missouri avenues. And we've got a very, you know, 19th century landscape. And it doesn't really deal with the sight line to the Washington Monument at all, as far as I can see. No. So, but that was, this is what the basis of what they developed the mall as until the Senate Park Commission. So here is the, my part about the canal. The canal was an, was an obstacle. Um, it was tremendously wide, 140 feet in some places, not very deep, not a lot of water flowing through it. So it became um, hazardous, needed a lot of dredging. It cut off the city from point south. You had, you had at least four bridges crossing it and bridges are constricting and bridges are things that need to be maintained. So it's in 1872, uh, Alexander Shepard and the Board of Public Works uh, start to uh, underground this. So there's a sewer and there's still other stuff down there. Um, so the Senate Park Commission, so we've got the Botanic Garden, we've got the mall and Senate Park Commission. Now this is created in the wake of the 1900 celebration of the city. So for a few years, people have been planning, well, what can we do to improve Washington, DC? Anniversaries are very often the kind of markers for, we wanna hit this anniversary, some grand celebration to show some new improvement. Of course, Senate Park Commission is off by a year or so. Um, they, Congress didn't really agree to this, the Senate committee on the district set up this commission. So it wasn't a congressional commission, it was um, a Senate committee commission, kind of a pet project of Senator McMillan. So that was one impulse. Another impulse was, well, we've just finished creating land out of the Potomac River. All of this land, what are we going to do with it? And if we're gonna do anything with it, we need to make it look nice. So I have to do something with that. And there's also the question, um, the government has expanded and we need more office space. And where are we going to put those office buildings? Office buildings, government buildings had been often placed in some ways logically. So you would put the government printing office, or you'd acquire a building for government printing office by the train station. So because you're dealing with publications and not so far from the Capitol, so you can run back and forth. Uh, Treasury and the others by the White House. Um, but You've got a city now, and where can you insert other government buildings? And what kind of government buildings and how do they relate to uh, their neighborhood and how do they function? So uh, people thought a lot about that then, maybe a little less now, but. So the men who were on the commission were Daniel Burnham and Frederick Law Olmsted. Those were the first two. Uh, Macmillan chose them and then told them, well, you get to choose whoever else 
the third person you want on the commission. And that was Charles McKim, a good friend of Daniel Burnham. And then along the way, they kind of scooped up Augusta St. Gordon's partly sculpt. You would think sculptor, maybe not so much uh, for this commission, but he knew about placing things, citing things. So he, if he's working on memorials, you know, you want to put a memorial in the appropriate place with the right sight lines and the right topography. So that was what he brought to it. Of course, Trader Glomstead was the landscape architect and Burnham and McKim the architects. So watching my time. Uh, once they assembled, they began to work. Uh, they said they very much used the rubric of we're restoring the Lafont plan. So and the Lafont plan with the assumption being behind it or with it and stated is that Lafont and President Washington had worked out all of these issues. So we just need to go back and implement what they had decided. So there was a lot of gravity, a lot of weight that came with that that would allow them to pursue their goals. So in the park, in the Park Commission report, Appendix E deals with botanical collections. So they didn't deal with the botanic gardens per se, but they said we want something really grand. So a great systematic collection of living plants under the direction of the Department of Architect Agriculture. Remember, botanic gardens under Congress. They said it shouldn't be recreational, that systematic collection, but they wanted to have You'll hear, I've heard this several times, they wanted a large working museum of plants. Sounds a little bit funny to us, but basically a collection exhibiting plants. So, and they thought, well, this maybe could go in Potomac Park. So all those things that the Botanic Garden wasn't, it's not a systematic research collection. It was designed for recreation and it's located at the foot of the Capitol and they wanted to move this all the way to the opposite end of the mall, or what would become the mall. So, and wanted to point out that they didn't have any animus against the Botanic Garden per se. They, they, they didn't aim at that for any particular reason, except it did not fit into their conception of what the mall should be. The whole south side of the mall was supposed to be erased of all the red brick buildings that were there. The Armory, Army Medical Museum, Smithsonian National Museum, Agriculture, Engraving and Printing, those were all supposed to go. Um, if you look at, they built models of what is and what we would like it to be, what the future should be. And what the future should be did not have anything like the Smithsonian on it. Someone said to me, well, isn't that dishonest? And I'm like, well, you're pointing out what you would like. You're not going to label each change that's going to happen. And partly the plan was designed for the long term. So, but all that red brick on the south side was supposed to go and the botanic garden as well. And what they were thinking, and the Park Commission had uh, been to Europe as part of the commission, they went in the summer and visited a variety of capital cities. And they had in mind when they thought Botanic Garden, they thought of someplace like Kew Gardens, which is 330 acres inside London. So compare that to what the Botanic Garden was at the foot of the capital and how constrained that would be. The Botanic Garden couldn't really grow. It couldn't really expand its mission. So their idea is, well, we want to have a really grand Botanic Garden, and that space is not the right place for it. So we start to get the, them leveraging in uh, changes to push the Botanic Garden out. So here's a, a map showing 
Botanic Garden, Bartoli Fountain, and the Grant Memorial. So you can see, you, Grant is kind of horning in there, uh, but if you imagine, you know, cast your eye to the left, all the way out to the Washington Monument, you can see, okay, this is this is part of that larger plan to connect these monuments and connect the whole entire composition of the mall. You have to have a you have to have a starting place. You want to connect this to the Capitol, so you have a a marker at the foot of the Capitol, which then can carry you out to the end of the mall. So that was the Grant Memorial. And so the other thing on this map, which I couldn't make big enough, were the trees. Now, I never really thought about the trees being so not important, but having such resonance or such advocacy for them. Um, the trees were what we now call witness trees or they're historic trees. So there was one for Crittenden, there's an Alexander Shepherd tree. There were a bunch of different trees that had historic connotations. And you, if you can see all those kind of little white dots on there, those are all those historic trees. Um, and if, and the, the funny thing, I. I read through some of the histories and I wonder I wondered why they had so much difficulty later finding which tree was which. But it turns out that the head of the botanic garden didn't label them because he didn't want people snapping off souvenirs. So that would that kind of hindered preserving them later on because it wasn't labeled. So you would take this map and go out there and see if there's a tree in approximately the place that you expected it to be. So then who advocated for the Park Commission plan? Well, the Park Commission did. And then they were still engaged as what was called the consultative board in a, for the few years following. And then after a Teddy Roosevelt try, the Commission of Fine Arts was established. And it wasn't to deal with the law, or to deal with the Macmillan plan per se, but to deal with issues that that had dealt with. But you had a lot of the same people. You had Olmsted, you had Burnham. You couldn't have McKim because he had died. And so had St. Gobans. And but a lot of these people are all in the same milieu. They're all they all talk the same language. And Charles Moore was uh, Macmillan's secretary and had uh, helped write revise the commission report. And so he was he was not a member of the commission, but he was a member of the Commission of Fine Arts. And then and so you have Olmsted on there for the first for two terms, eight years. And then he rolls off, but he's still consulted. So when it comes to landscape issues, Olmsted Jr. is the one people consult. Whether or not they actually do what he wants and follows follow his advice is another question, but they do consult him. And it's you get points for having consulted Olmsted. And then in 1926, we get the National Capital Park and Planning Commission, which really does get the responsibility for implementing the Park Commission plan. And that also includes Frederick Olmsted Jr. Um, for a uh, six year term. So he's he's even when he's not on an official commission, he's still around uh, keeping an eye on things. So, like I said, Senate Park Commission plan was a struggle to implement it. You, if you imagine, I tried to find a good picture of it, but if you imagine you've got a roll of, you've got a roll of paper and it keeps trying to roll back up on you. You've got your plans, keep trying to roll up on you. So you've got one weight 
at the Grant Memorial holding the plans down. You've got one wait at the end, Department of Agriculture. Department of Agriculture, they got it cited correctly. Agriculture wanted it way in the middle of the mall or kind of in the middle of the mall. And they got that pushed back and they got the new National Museum, which is now a natural history, got that one placed as well. So you've got three, you've got three things holding this down, nicely placed from each other. So even though the mall is still that very sylvan, very tree foresty uh, place, you've got the makings of the plant. And then joining Grant in the Botanic Gardens is Mead. So the Mead Memorial dedicated in 1927, it took them about a decade to get to this design. It was very, 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 very long, lots of discussions uh, to get these folks to that. And ultimately it got moved off of that space. But I think you can imagine why they wanted something really good because you're at the head of the mall, you're right next to Grant, and there's actually the assumption there's going to be another one parallel to you sitting there on the mall. So you want a really good memorial. So it, that's why it took them so long to, uh, to get it completed or designed and completed. So, um, so here's, the, here's that space. So Mead was going where the fountain was. And oops, right. Mead was going in the fountain was here's here's the plan for what they called Union Square. So Union Square was the small section of the Senate Park Commission div divvying up of the mall. You know, they had the Washington Division, they had the Lincoln Memorial Division, and they had Union Square. Union Square, U.S. Uh, Grant Memorial. So celebration of the Union victory. So we're straightening everything out, let's say. So you get rid of the Botanic Gardens, you add the Mead Memorial. They started on the Mead Memorial. The siting was in 1915. It wasn't installed until 1927. Another memorial is supposed to go right parallel to it. So basically, you know, almost on the site of one of those conservatories. The, the tree plan, the four ranks of trees are going to be extended to this area that the, the way they are all already on the mall. And there's this funny thing where if you look now and you see there's this really odd spot where Louisiana Avenue comes down, hits Constitution and stops, and there's this weird grassy spot that doesn't really relate to anything. Originally, they were supposed to extend it all the way down to Pennsylvania Avenue and build another circle. So you're gonna have like two circles next to each other. Uh, perhaps that's why they didn't do it. And below it parallel, they might have sketched in a circle or maybe not on Maryland Avenue. So this was, this was the plan and roll back from that for just one second. This was the plan. You will not be surprised to hear that Olmsted Jr. was given the assignment of implementing it. And he went and said, well, we didn't study this one really hard when we were working on the plan. So here's my idea. So he did not actually implement this. He decided that, and since he was part of the original commission, he could take liberties with what the commission had planned. People were 
uneasy with this. The Commission of Fine Arts really was unhappy with this, but people were uneasy with this because once you give that kind of out and say, well, we don't want to implement this piece of the Macmillan Commission plan, then doesn't that mean you can just X out everything else? So, but he did succeed in creating a you know, normal kind of green space. And now we would say Union Square. And they dug it up for the freeway and put in the reflecting pool. So his so his landscape is really gone from there. So we'll move on. So the people who were kind of standing in the way of the Botanic Gardens moving were William Smith, who was in charge for about 50 years, and George Hess, who had the task after him of keeping it safe. So in 1914, Congress asked the Commission of Fine Arts to consider moving it. The commission suggested combining with those propagating gardens down by the Washington Monument and putting them out in Potomac Park. So, so this is again the recreational and the and the the work at combined. So they were getting ready to store the Bartoli fountain, but then you know things intervened and Commission of Fine Arts punched it back to Congress saying, I think you need to decide where you would like to place this. So legislation came out and came up and someone said, well, let's just make where it is bigger and extend it all the way this to 6th Street. So from 1st Street to 6th Street, you can imagine the Commission of Fine Arts was not really pleased with this proposal and it got squelched. 1917, the commission goes and visits Mount Hamilton which is now where the National Arboretum is for to, as a location for the Botanic Garden. And ultimately, this is where they, they wanted this to go. No one had any idea of creating a separate National Arboretum at the time. So in the 1920s, Hess, who I told you was in charge, They were doing government reorganization, and uh, that included all different kinds of agencies, and they included the Botanic Garden. They said, well, where, where would you like to move the Botanic Garden to? And he said Rock Creek, as opposed to um, Mount Hamilton. And again, the Commission of Fine Arts really had Xed uh, Rock Creek off of the list. So, and the other part of it is what do you really do? What you really do is to run a conservatory largely for the use of members of Congress. Yes, and for the public in general. The conservatories are for the use of members of Congress just as the president's conservator is for his. So he's admitting that he grows flowers for Congress. So, you know, in 1920, we're working on uh, legislation to get the Botanic Gardens out. So this is now 18 years after the Senate Park Commission plan was launched and trying to nudge and you know grant memorials there we're still trying to nudge the botanic gardens out so like i said some people said let's put it in rock creek some people said well here we can at least give you some more land right now so james creek canal which is now canal street they said we can grow trees along there. It, would, it wasn't a street at that point. Um, the expansion on the mall over to 6th Street or Mount Hamilton. So 
we had legislation coming through in 20, and then continuing year after year. They introduced it in 25, and that kind of finally had traction and was passed in 1927, creating the Arboretum, which some people were kind of dismayed about because they said what we wanted was the National Botanic Garden and Arboretum. They wanted to, again, winch away the responsibility from Congress over to agriculture and combine the ideas and have this bigger Kew Gardens like Botanic Garden. So what, what actually happened? Well, we just scooted them down essentially one block into alignment with the Macmillan Commission plans and built the new buildings. They did try in 1934 to transfer it out of congressional control. There's, there's hearing materials which are somewhere at National Archives which I've not been able to get access to, of course. Um, so what we have today is due to this rivalry between you know, Congress and the president. It's never been transferred to agriculture. Um, it's kind, it, it was a congressional park. I don't know if they still grow flowers for uh, Congress. They might, um, but whatever it is, I don't think they would ever want to surrender it to agriculture. And it actually, the failure to move it, actually to move the jurisdiction actually did probably uh, save it because when they created the Arboretum, that got an extremely slow start and there was you know acquiring the land and then no budget and so it started in 27 and didn't open until 1954. so um, it, you can imagine that if agriculture was trying to manage the botanic garden into their budget as well that might have not gone well so and i was just noticing that they actually do have a big production facility over across the Anacostia, actually down in Bellevue um, by the water treatment plant. And this does do a lot of that, they, almost two acres of land to be growing. Uh, plants for public display. Questions? If you have any questions, um, everybody's on mute, so just be sure to unmute yourself and you can ask a question or um, you actually, I just got a, a message that um, someone is the uh, Deputy Executive Director of the Botanical Gardens on the line, so that's wonderful. Hey. If you want to unmute yourself and say some words, that would be great. Hey, this is Susan Pell. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to actually, you had a question about whether or not we provide flowers to Congress anymore. We do not provide cut flowers to congressional offices any longer, but we do still provide office plants to the Senate offices. The House actually took that uh, that sort of service away from themselves in the mid 1990s. Oh, I think I remember reading about that. That's kind of too bad, I guess. I don't know. It seemed like a good promotional thing to keep yourself in a business to be giving flowers to people in Congress. Well, and if you have two acres of greenhouses to be growing things, have, yeah. you might have capacity. Are there more questions? Um, this is Elizabeth. Um, is um this is a question for the director uh is the um facility down by blue plains under your jurisdiction the uh, production facility is yeah it's um part of the botanic garden i thought so i i suppose you're probably not doing public tours under present circumstances but um i do recommend them to others at such time as they're offered again we just actually did a virtual uh, production facility open house, and you can still find those videos on our social media and on our website. That's good to know. It's really a wonderful facility. Mm -hmm. Thank you for keeping it um, so nice. 
Can I take a walk? Can everybody hear me? A little bit if you speak loudly. Okay, I understand a lot of this is under the control of the architecture of the Capitol. How did that come about? Well, um, when Hess retired, they appointed the architect of the Capitol in charge of the Botanic Garden. So that's that's one way, and uh, they just transferred Union Square to the architect of the Capitol, I think, in the past 10 years. I could be wrong about that. Mm. So they expanded the they they expanded the architect's physical jurisdiction to include all of Union Square. And back when like I said, back when Hess retired, the architecture capital is in charge of botanic gardens. Are there any follow up comments, uh, David, or no? No. <laughs> Thank you. So there's that virtual tour, a link to it. Oh, Thank excellent. You. Are there other questions? Hearing none. <laughs> Well, uh, that that was wonderful, uh, Matthew. Thank you so much for a really interesting presentation. It was great also to have uh, Susan on the line. Um, so thank you. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, uh, we're looking forward. I've I've I was privy to information that Matthew is actually working on a book. Uh, the title is yet to be uh, announced, but uh, we're hoping that to hear about that soon in the next couple months. Um, uh, so, probably not. Probably not that soon because it's still being written. So. <laughs> okay. Well, well, whenever it's done, we'll be here. So we'll be eager to uh, to hear about it. So we appreciate your time uh, to present with us.